As Sub-Saharan Africa lags behind in achieving the Millennium Development Goals, British Prime Minister Gordon Brown is urging business leaders to step up and play a larger role in development. For more, I'm joined by Neville Isdell, CEO of Coca-Cola, one of the companies showcasing their African initiatives, and Gareth Thomas, the UK Minister for Trade. Thank you both so much for being with us on CNBC Africa. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Isa, let me start with you. Um, a lot of times when we see these big groupings and these big PR events with the Prime Minister, all the CEOs of these major companies gathering in one place to call to action on the MDGs, some people question perhaps how authentic that is or how genuine that attention to Africa is. How do you respond to those kinds of claims? Well, I think it's very simple. It is growth, growth in the economies that are going to bring people out of poverty and have brought people out of poverty, as the Prime Minister pointed out. Now, Mr. Thomas, let me turn to you for a second. In terms of the MDGs, 2008 is the halfway point, and a lot has been made about the fact that we haven't had as much progress as one might have hoped. It's been disappointing. Some people have described it as disappointing. What needs to happen now, given the fact that Sub-Saharan Africa is so far behind even other developing parts of the world, and, and, and as we stand, none of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa Africa will meet any of the MDGs by 2015. Well, I think we need to recognize that um, there are countries that are on track to meet the Millennium um, Development Goals. Up until last week, Mo Siiwa Lakota, a former defense minister and ex-ANC chairperson, was tipped to be Cope's candidate in the April elections. He joins us now. Mr. Lakota, it's an absolute pleasure to have you. Thanks for being with us on CNBC Africa. It's my privilege. So were you surprised by the choice of uh, Bishop Dandala to um, be the face of COPE in this election? No, I was not surprised. We had uh, taken a decision at our conference in December. So you're confident that he's the right person to lead your party and you're confident that he's the best match to face off against Jacob Zuma in April? He is uh, indeed the very best because at this time, especially in our society, we need moral regeneration and we need leadership that has got intact integrity that cannot be questioned. So you're and saying that, that you've chosen wrong. him to make a break from the ANC, to make a clean break from the ANC? Two things. Until now, people have been elected to leadership in government on the basis that they might have spent years in jail on Robben Island or very many years in exile or in the underground. Without regard for the fact that very many South Africans, capable, experienced men and women of integrity uh, who can serve our nation today, need not necessarily have gone to jail to do it. We are making a clear, clean break with a culture that suggests that only those who had gone to jail or exile can be elected to leadership. As food prices continue to soar, we take a look at one of the essential ingredients to modern agriculture, fertilizers. Consumption of fertilizers in developing countries has increased by 56% over the past eight years. That's according to the International Fertilizer Industry Association. As a result, the price of some fertilizers has almost tripled since last year. And as demand for food and biofuels increases, so does the need for more fertilizers. But the high cost is forcing farmers in Africa to grow less crops. And the United Nations says 100 million people are at risk because of the food crisis. But fertilizer companies are confident they can produce enough to keep up with demand. Joining me for more is Tulif Enger, CEO of Yara International, the Norwegian agrochemicals company and one of the largest fertilizer companies in the world. A lot of the big agricultural companies in the world, uh, like Monsanto in the United States, for example, have been making huge profits on the back of the food crisis. And of course, that doesn't put them in a very positive light when they say we're trying to help. How do you respond to that kind of thing? Well, I mean, we are a business and it's a global market that decides prices. Mr. Mandelson, thank you so much for being with us on CNBC Africa. It's a pleasure. Mr. Mandelson, how can there be a level playing field when African nations know that if they don't sign a deal by the end of this year, they're going to have to make do with a deal that's much worse than what they might get? Is that the right kind of environment to come to the negotiating table? Well, of course, we've been given seven years by the World Trade Organization, the WTO, to negotiate these economic partnership agreements.
Well, extraordinary scenes here at the World Economic Forum in Davos yesterday. We had the Turkish Prime Minister storming out of a Middle Eastern session. Uh, Karina, my colleague uh, from uh, CNBC Arabia, was in that session. Karina, what happened? Jeff, shortly after 7.30 p.m. late last night, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the Prime Minister of Turkey, stormed out. At the end of what was a very long, very tense session discussing Middle East peace, we had some very strongly worded statements from Ban Ki-moon and Amr Musa, as well as, obviously, Shimon Perez. Now, Shimon Perez was speaking out in defense of Israel actions in the Gaza Strip over the past few weeks. He made a few statements, such as the fact that, according to him, there had been not one single day of starvation in the Gaza Strip. He said that none of the border crossings between Gaza and Israel had been closed. Now, these are statements that many people would disagree with. In addition to that, he also started out by saying that democracy is not about elections, it's about civilizations, thereby almost delegitimizing Hamas as the democratically elected force by the Palestinian people. Now, right after walking out of the session, clearly agitated, his face was red. During his speech, Perez was pointing his finger many times at Erdogan. I was in the room. The tension was really palpable. He walked out, headed straight back to Turkey. He was welcomed in Istanbul by a welcoming crowd, a throng of people, almost 5,000 people, calling him the conqueror of Davos. I mean, we, I think, were starting to believe that there was a, a, a settling down of the tensions, really, on the Gaza Strip. I mean, it, you know, ob obviously, the, the hostilities, uh, the, the heat of the, um, um, uh, the situation, not as, as, as high as it was. Um, what do we think this event, if anything, is going to do for the situation in the Gaza? I think what this event demonstrates is that this is a very hot topic and emotions run extremely high. I should point out that Amr Musa, Secretary General of the Arab League, after launching a scathing indictment of Israel's attacks on Gaza, sounded a fairly optimistic and hopeful note saying that with the new administration, perhaps in a not so subtle jab at the Bush administration, saying that he was hoping now, under the new administration, that the U.S. could return to its role of an honest broker. George Mitchell, the U.S. envoy, is currently in the Middle East. He's currently negotiating with Fatah a potential open of the borders under Fatah supervision to potentially allow some goods in but also potentially prevent the smuggling of illicit weapons which is a very important sticking point with regards to the negotiation with Israel. Now Davos tries to present itself as a, a fairly neutral forum. Well we're joined now by Karina Kamel. Uh, she's a correspondent from our sister station CNBC Arabia. Good evening. So is this one man or two men? Well, it's interesting, Guy. First of all, let me just point out that this isn't the first time that Abu Dhabi's made a foray into international investments. We know the traditional investments, uh, obviously, in the banking and the real estate sector. What this really signals is a shift in their investment strategy, a diversification of their portfolios. Now, the man who's diversifying his portfolio is Sheikh Mansour bin Zayed Al Maktoum. Now, he is a member of the Abu Dhabi ruling family, and he is the person who's actually coughing up the cash, 200 million pounds of them. And it's, it's important to put this in context as well, because this is more than two and a half times what Thailand's former ousted prime minister paid just one year ago. How are these investments seen in the Emirates? Hollywood films are not always um, necessarily sort of topping the bill when it comes to the cinemas in the region and, and maybe there's some sort of cultural differences but, but how are these sort of acquisitions received uh, in, in that part of the world as well? I think they're received extremely positively and I think one of the things that this particular investment in Hollywood is trying to do and they made it very clear is that they're not just simply going to be investing in Hollywood films. They want to attract A-list talent to the region but they also want to be producing and making Arab films with Arab actors for an Arab audience. So that definitely is something that's very welcome in the region. Certainly looks like a whole load of interesting investments. Karina, thank you very much indeed.